Welcome to Elevating La Cultura podcast, a space where I talk with Latinas who are passionate about what they do and are willing to share their passion with others to change the narrative, especially for the next generation. Each season is centered around different topics, but all with a Latina perspective. This is season six and is going to be featuring Latinas in the food space. I hope this season is inspiring and perhaps even nostalgic as we hear stories we can relate to. I'm so excited to share these stories and talk about food. So vamonos and let's get into it. Hola, today I'm talking with Valeria, a life and health coach. She helps women of color ditch diet culture and eat more plants so that they can fuel their life. And she's talking with us today all about what it means to have a vegan lifestyle. So please enjoy. Hey, I am chatting with Vale today. I'm so excited to talk all about what it means to be a vegan. So before we get into it, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, thank you so much for having me on. My name is Valeria or Vale for short, and I am a life and health coach for women and femmes of color. As Karina mentioned, I specialize in plant-based nutrition, so I am vegan, and I also enjoy um, helping my clients with intuitive eating and lifestyle design. So super excited to be here. Yes, I think that there is not enough info out there about what that all means. And so I am just so excited to really get into all of the terms, all of the nuances, and even like talk about some myths around like that lifestyle. Um, but before we get really into it, I would love to know, like, what got you to the place that you are now? Did you always want to be like this, this food coach? No. Um, so I want to take it back actually, like to my childhood. I didn't know about veganism or vegetarian or anything like that really until I was much older in life. Like I grew up with a very traditional Mexican family. There was always meat and cheese and like, you know, all the Mexican foods um, at our family gatherings. And, you know, I have a really big family. So there was always a birthday or like a baptism or a quinceanera. Um, so it wasn't really until my dad, uh, he's a big joker, you know, always teasing me. When I was pretty young, I would say like nine years old, I was eating some fish. And at the time, I was really obsessed with Little Mermaid. It was my favorite Disney movie growing up. So he was joking with me saying, oh, that fish you're eating could be Flounder's cousin. Um, you know, Flounder being one of the main characters of Little Mermaid. And I, at that time, like even as a little kid, I made the connection like, oh, this fish I'm eating used to be alive, like used to have a family, it had feelings, you know, and now like it's dead and I'm eating it. And that was the first time I remember really making that connection and wanting to not eat animals. And then, you know, I wanted to go vegetarian right away, but my parents were like, no, you need protein. Like you're a growing girl. Like we're not going to change your diet right now. So it wasn't until I was in high school, I was 15 at the time where I wrote a persuasive essay for an English class and we could write it on anything we wanted. It just had to be like persuasive. So I wrote mine on why my parents should let me go vegetarian and ended up um, t like reciting it to my parents and, you know, actually like showing them the essay. And thankfully, after a lot of research that I did on my own ha behalf, they let me go vegetarian because um, I was still living at home. So, you know, my mom would cook all our meals. Um, and then once I was in college, more independent, you know, I had a meal plan, but I was still cooking a lot for myself as a student. Um, and I met someone that was vegan. And I had always thought that veganism was like, uh, you're drinking wheatgrass shots and eating salad and that's about it. And uh, it wasn't until I met that vegan friend that I realized, oh, like vegans actually eat like normal stuff like rice and bread and beans and like pizza. Like I can do this, you know, I'm already vegetarian. So I went vegan in college. I was 21. So I've been vegan seven years now. Um, but yeah, I wasn't always vegan I wasn't always even vegetarian and I actually didn't even get into health really like because you know there's the uh vegans that do it for health right 
And that was not me at all. I was all about the animals and the environmental impacts of veganism. Um, but it wasn't until I actually went through my own health journey that I really started considering health coaching. Um, so that was in 2017. I was already vegan for a couple years, but I was feeling really exhausted, feeling um, really down like mentally and physically. I had just moved to a new city and I was having a hard time adjusting from that, you know, college to postgraduate life. And um, I just remember, you know, scrolling through Facebook, eating takeout and drinking wine. And I was living by myself at the time, um, doing long distance with my now fiance. So it was just really hard on all aspects of health. Um, but I was scrolling Facebook and I saw an acquaintance that I had met through a vegan Kansas City group um, said that they were doing a health like challenge. Um, so I hired her as my health coach because I was just so sick and tired of feeling drained and like I knew that I could be healthier as a vegan. I just didn't know what to cook and what to be eating. And it wasn't until I worked with her that I found out like, oh, there's this whole other side of vegan veganism that's like whole foods plant-based and really like um, helps you feel very energized. And like, I got rid of a lot of my mental fog. I stopped drinking three coffees a day and it was just such a 180 transformation and that's when I really started thinking, like, everyone needs to feel this way. Like, everyone deserves to feel energized and feel alive in their body and feel confident. So that's really when I got into health coaching and what was having my own transformation. Wow. So taking it back to when you were a, a kid and you're telling your family that you want to be a vegetarian was that transition easy for them um to make you meals that were vegetarian while still making traditional meals with meat for the rest of the family mm -hmm. um i will say like my mom was the main cook in the family and that is kind of the reason why i started getting more involved in the kitchen is when i went vegetarian because I did part of the compromise, you know, and persuading my parents to let me do this was to for me to uh, cook for myself, you know, whenever my mom was making something with meat, I would supplement that with whatever vegetarian protein I made at the time. Um, a lot of times it was beans or like something with dairy, which I now don't consume, but it was a little challenging because my mom, I'm very grateful for her and I'm very lucky to have her. She would... Um, you know, if I had a lot of work at school, she would cook my own thing um, instead of asking me to do it sometimes. So my brother was really picky. He was seven years younger, or he still is seven years younger than me at the time. So he was really, you know, around when I was 15, he was eight years old. So he was a type of kid that only wanted to eat pizza and chicken fingers, you know, that kind of picky. So my mom when I went vegetarian, I ended up making like three separate things, you know, one for her and my dad and then a vegetarian thing and then the thing for the picky eater. Uh, so, you know, I, it was a, it was a challenge that way, but the more I kind of learned about vegetarian protein and, and how to eat and how to cook those foods, I was able to help out more in the kitchen and just get more involved. I think that's a great way to, uh, incorporate like that lifestyle change mm -hmm. with um, like more ease, like to be able yeah. to say, okay, well, if you, if you want to do this, then come alongside me and like teach me too. And we'll all learn together mm -hmm. and we'll all do this lifestyle yeah. change together. So that's, mm -hmm. that's great. That's beautiful. Uh, quick story. Actually, it's really funny. I remember one time my mom made, um, tacos de papa con chorizo and she like fried them so it's like potato tacos with chorizo I guess is the translation um and instead of using pork chorizo she used soy riso and which is vegetarian and she didn't tell my dad um so she served them and I was eating them and my dad was like wait I thought you didn't eat meat anymore and I was like I don't and he was he didn't make the connection, I guess, that those didn't have meat in them. He was like, oh, these tacos are really good, like t complimenting my mom on them, how delicious they were. 
and she was just like oh you don't notice anything different about them I was like, no they're just like really delicious and I was just like cracking up the whole time because he didn't even realize that they were vegetarian and then we told him and he was like oh actually yeah you know they did taste a little off I'm like you you're only saying that because now you know they're vegetarian but he was like loving it at first because he's definitely the kind of person that you know no one in my family is vegetarian or vegan so he he's the one that I think teases me the most about it it's got calmed down over the past seven years but definitely he's he's all about his meat yeah sometimes I think it's more of the like when you know that it's not meat Mm -hmm. then you can taste it more it's like Mm -hmm. that power of suggestion or hindsight bias yes yeah yeah it's like a psychological thing literally it's Mm -hmm. yeah um, well, I would love for you to maybe give a quick synopsis of like all of the terms that we hear, like vegetarian and mm-hmm. what's the difference between vegetarian and vegan and yeah. um, plant-based and mm-hmm. like all of these terms that we're hearing, but don't necessarily understand. Like we might think we understand, yeah. but if you could like give a clear like yeah. definition of each of those that'd be great mm-hmm. okay so veg so i'll start with omnivore like you'll hear vegans or vegetarians say that word and actually it means to eat plants and animals like you eat everything you know um so most people are omnivores or at least in the u.s um and then there's the term herbivore and these terms are actually used for like animals out in the wild not usually humans but we sometimes use them for humans um so like an herbivore would be like a rabbit i think they don't eat meat or insects um you know they just eat plants so like those are natural herbivores in the wild or like um different types of cats are carnivores and carnivores are like animals that only eat meat so then going to the vegetarian vegetarians don't eat like dead animals so anything that requires an animal to die in the process um and this is not just like meat or like fish or you know i know when i say meat a lot of people don't think of fish so that's why i say those things separately but um a lot of people also might not remember that like broth so like to make chicken broth you essentially have to use chicken which is not vegetarian so therefore like chicken broth is not vegetarian um some gel uh, jellos and yogurts have gelatin in them which is crushed bone marrow so that is not considered vegetarian because again to get the bones you have to kill the animal you can't really extract bones from an animal without killing it um so those things are not considered vegetarian and there's a couple other things you know that i might not not have mentioned Um, Google is your best friend in this case, you know, if there's specific ingredients that you're questioning. And then we go into uh, different types of vegetarian. So there's ovo lacto vegetarian, and that means vegetarians that eat eggs. Ovo is the egg, lacto is the dairy. So there are uh, vegetarians out there, like I have a coworker who's Indian and she is vegetarian because of her religion, Hinduism. So she doesn't eat eggs, um, but she does eat dairy. So she would be like a lacto vegetarian. And then there's, you know, just the ovo vegetarians or just lacto vegetarians, but the ovo and lacto, and that's you eat eggs and dairy. So then um, moving down to closer to veganism, there is um, plant based, which is a term that I think a lot of people have adopted to kind of describe like more loosey goosey sort of I try to be as vegan as possible or I try to avoid meat. I've met people that still eat fish that call themselves plant-based. I've met people that are practically vegan, but maybe sometimes if they are home for the holidays, like they'll have cheese, like tamales with cheese in them, for example, or they'll, you know, be a little more flexible, or maybe they're essentially vegan, but not have not incorporated like all the lifestyle aspects of veganism so maybe they have some makeup that's not fully vegan or they still have some leather things or they'll go to zoos which like that is not really considered vegan because of the animal cruelty associated so plant-based is this term that i think has a lot of marketing buzz around it too but there's no official definition so when i say plant-based like that means something different to me than like 
another person that might call themselves plant-based and still eat seafood or still eats dairy or things like that. So really, you know, if someone's saying, oh, this is plant-based, blah, 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 if you're wondering, you know, it's always best to ask. Um, but vegan is one of those words that is like clearly defined, just like vegetarian, it has a hard definition. And that is anything that has animal products in it, um, you know, and I think there's the official term says like, as close to uh, realistic as possible, because in this modern society, like there's no way to be 100% vegan, because we drive in our cars and a bug hits the windshield, that bug is now dead. Does that mean driving isn't vegan? No, <laughs> like we have to drive, you know, or at least in the US. I mean, there's maybe in New York City, you don't need to drive, but like most places you need to drive and and that's just inevitable. You know, um, most modern production of bread, when they're churning the thingies to make the wheat and like grind all those grains, there's bugs living in those plants and those bugs get killed. Does that mean bread is not vegan? No, that does not mean bread is not vegan. You know, if there's no honey or milk in the bread, then it would be vegan. But little things like that, like you can't control to a certain extent. So I always say, like, think of things you can reasonably control. And do they have animal products in them? Like, were animals um, killed or harmed in the process of making that or uh, executing that production? Then, like, might not be considered vegan. Um, so. Yeah, I know I went on a little tangent there, but hopefully that defines all those things clearly. Yes, I'm fascinated. I I really appreciate the those uh, or that breakdown of each of those because, like, we hear all of these words and these terms, mm -hmm. and these like I know when I was in school, like I was not mm -hmm. taught like really well, like even in health class, like how mm -hmm. the whole food pyramid, like that is all yeah. like I grew up knowing the food pyramid. And mm -hmm. so like we may have heard some like vegetarian is a term that I may have heard when I was younger, but mm -hmm. um, I think there is like this lack of knowledge between what all of these terms are and like our assumptions based on what mm -hmm. we hear and what the media mm -hmm. tells us or like like you said it's it's what's trending and so it's like what yeah. influencers are putting out there as like the thing that's in um mm -hmm. so it's really helpful to hear like a little bit more about what each of those terms means um, mm -hmm. It gives us a little bit more insight into like the thoughtfulness and yeah. the intentionality behind choosing to be either vegetarian, plant-based or vegan. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to know if someone is wanting to maybe um, change their lifestyle, mm -hmm. what is a way to start introducing little things or like how can we get the wheels turning? Yeah in one direction? I love that question because I think it can be very overwhelming when you, maybe you make that connection like I did when I was younger of like, wow, I'm eating dead animals. Like maybe I don't want to do this. Um, I think the biggest and most important step that a lot of people skip, and I always work with my clients on this, is the mindset and solidifying your why power. I like to call it why power because it's like, why are you doing this? Like embarking on changing your lifestyle is really hard, regardless of it's a vegetarian or you want to do meatless Monday or you're wanting to go completely vegan. There are going to be times when it'll be easier to revert back to your old habits, um, but really solidifying like, why am I doing this? You know, watching documentaries and learning about maybe it got you got interested in it because you heard about the health benefits so like watch a documentary like what the health on netflix is a great one or maybe you really love uh sustainability and like eco-friendly living watch about a documentary about like how climate change and the animal agriculture industry are linked and that will really help educate you on why this is such a worthwhile thing to do and then once you know that education is down and that's you know a thing that can keep continuing but i would say the first tactical actionable step in your changing your food choices is choosing one meal that is the easiest 
to make vegetarian or plant-based or whatever you're wanting to do. Um, usually it's breakfast for a lot of people because breakfast foods can be really easily veganized. Like if you have milk and cereal, most cereals are ve already vegan um, unless they have, you know, dairy in them. But I think it's pretty easy to find a, a cereal that doesn't have any animal products. So, you know, all you have to do there is swap out the milk for plant-based milk. And a lot of people are already drinking non-dairy milk. I think last time you went to the grocery store, like I'm sure you saw a million different types of non-dairy milk. Um, I think we have milked all the nuts and seeds that are out there in the world by now. It's pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, choosing one meal, it's like, this is the meal that I'm going to tackle and make, try to make this vegan every day. And then when that has been solidified, I always like to work with my clients on like getting two to three go-to dishes that they can cook at home that are easy, that they have the ingredients on hand for. So one of these for me is a black bean quinoa bowl, burrito bowl. Um, and I make it in the Instapot and it's literally just like quinoa, black beans, salsa, uh, bell peppers, and spinach. And I just like put all those things in the Instapot and let it cook. And I have like four meals for the week already there. So things like that where it's simple, low uh, number of ingredients on the list, not anything too crazy, like ingredients that you're familiar with already that are already plant-based. And that really gets the wheels turning because a lot of people will be surprised how easy it is to shift, you know, just a couple things in the ways that they're cooking and make things vegan. So I have to ask because there are like, we are coming up to the holidays and if you are the only one in your family who is uh, eating like a different lifestyle, whether it is vegetarian, vegan, plant-based, how do you approach like a family gathering where no one really understands or will have food that you would typically eat? Yeah. The biggest thing is setting expectations and communicating. So let's say you're going to a family gathering and no one else is vegetarian or vegan, like anything, you know, they're all huge into me and they love putting bacon bits in the green beans or things, little things like that, like things that could be easily vegetarian and then get ruined with the, the bacon bits, um, which I, that has happened to me multiple times, which is why I say that. So the biggest thing I say is um, once you've made that decision, like I want to not eat meat for this things coming Thanksgiving or eat a totally vegan Thanksgiving, communicating that with whoever is hosting. So, you know, hey, mom or like whoever, sister, like I won't be eating animal products. This is what that means. Uh, no dairy, no eggs, no meat. Um, I will be bringing a dish. So like definitely offer to bring a dish or like just come prepared with your own stuff and let them know, you know, and they can choose to maybe make the mashed potatoes without butter and use olive oil instead, or use a vegan butter, which is really easy to find like nowadays. Um, and they may or may not do that, you know, depending on how accommodating or familiar they are with the ingredients, but always come prepared with your own dish. And usually what happens to me is I come with my own like vegan dish and it's make sure it's delicious because people might want to try it. Um, and, you know, I always think cooking vegan things and bringing them to gatherings where non-vegans are present is always a great opportunity for not only act, uh, education, but also activism. Like I've been a vegan for seven years, but I think the years I was most passionate about veganism for like, you know, most intensely were the first two years because your mind is just completely blown away of like all this information that you're learning and how great you're feeling. Um, and of course, I'm still passionate about it, but I'm just saying like when you make that initial change, it's really eye opening. So using that energy and that new vegan um, pizzazz to educate people and, you know, share how delicious it can be is a really great thing as well. But Oftentimes people will start eating the vegan thing and be like, oh my God, this is so good. I can't believe it's vegan. Like, can I have some more of it? Um, so, you know, that might happen and be totally open to that possibility. 
So, and, and it might happen that people are like, don't want to try it because they're afraid of, of new things, which is a totally natural and human reaction. So, you know, just manage expectations and, and definitely come prepared with your own food, but it's, it's not impossible to be the only vegan in the family. I've been doing it for seven years and I think it opens up a lot of great and interesting conversations. I think that like even going into the holidays there as a Latine person, Mm -hmm. like we might already be used to like going into a situation kind of on edge because, you know, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotions and a lot of, Mm -hmm. there's just a lot when it comes to family and there's like a lot of us are healing right now from past traumas. So how have you, um, you mentioned that your father wasn't always like, I don't know, like he said things yeah, about um, not eating meat. So how Mm -hmm. would you like help people prepare mentally to enter Mm -hmm. those situations with the added layer of maybe they'll make fun of me and Mm -hmm. like ridicule me because like, Mm -hmm. I mean coming from experience like the latino family like will latch on to something and they will like harp on it over and over and over (laughs) um so do you have any tips on how to prepare mentally for that yes so this might be like equal parts comforting and like a downer but i always tell myself for those that are the teasers and those that are the, you know, people always cracking jokes at others' expenses, they're all, there's always going to be something to make fun of you about. Like, even if you're not vegetarian, even if you're not vegan, um, especially in our generation, I think we are breaking these generational curses. We are going to therapy. We are doing a lot of things that um, our parents might have not had access or education to, and that's okay. They did their best no hate on the parents or the older generations but it's just different now so i think um with that like with those differences come different ways of eating too and different ways of having relationships with our food and body like how many times um you know maybe you've experienced i know i have the the toxic theas that comment about your weight or comment about your body or comment about how much food you're eating or how little food you're eating like there's always going to be comments with latino families and that's just something that like i've made peace with and i think it's very helpful and important to accept you can't change people so really what you can control and what you can change is how you react to people's comments and i think that brings me a lot of uh mental peace is just knowing there will be comments and that's okay because those comments mean nothing about me and they mean more about the person that's saying them than anything so this goes for you know being vegan or having gained some covid weight or you know not having a boyfriend or whatever it is whatever your situation is Um, So really standing firm on your ground. And if you want to defend yourself, like come come equipped with the education on the facts, because there are a lot of chances to, you know, share some facts of like vegans are not protein deprived or there's actually a lot of Mexican foods and Latino foods that are originally plant based. And actually the colonizers are the one that brought the dairy and the pork and the refined sugars to Mesoamerica. So, you know, if you really want to play that game, like the the indigenous foods of the Americas, Latin America, um, are oftentimes plant based. So you know that that's a fact too but coming educated with the facts if anyone wants to question you or like tease about the vegan stuff like that is very helpful or you can always just like change the subject fully if you don't even want to go into it like someone is making fun of you for like not eating meat like a lot of my cousins um or you know aunts and uncles would be like oh you're mexican and you don't eat meat like que onda con eso like you know it's like how how are you truly Mexican? Or even some acquaintances in college would say that, and I'm just like, my culture and my nationality is not defined by what's on my plate. So that's how I'm Mexican. <laughs> like, you know, um, 
things like that. You can always have a comeback or you can just change the subject, but really standing firm in like your values and not letting people sway you one way or the other. And just remembering whatever someone has to say about you, it's really about them. And it's really about, they don't feel secure in themselves and they feel like they have to make comments about other people's life decisions. I love that you talked about how it, the colonizers brought in a lot of the foods that make dishes not vegan. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to learn more about that because yeah. I think I hear that vegan is a very white thing. Yeah. And so I'd love for you to like flip that mm-hmm. around. Yeah. So yeah, there is a lot of misconceptions about how veganism is a white people thing. And it's frankly just not true because even even though, you know, our, and when I say our ancestors, I'm talking about like Latina community, um, our ancestors and like the indigenous people of the Latin American cont- continents, um, you know, they may have eaten meat, but a lot of the ingredients and the majority of the foods were plant-centered corn, like elote, um, tomatoes, like different types of peppers, different types of potatoes. So quinoa is like originally from Latin American countries. So, you know, all these foods that are like now the hot trendy, you know, like kale and quinoa and all these things, like were originally from our native land. So really like, uh, yeah, the Spaniards brought the cows and they brought what else um pork like anything associated with pigs so like lard wasn't used originally in the indigenous foods and that started being used after colonization um and a lot of these foods are also uh foods that may have negative health impacts when consumed like over consumed and we see this a lot like I'll speak on Mexico because that's where I'm from, um, is there's a lot of diabetes, there's a lot of high cholesterol and heart disease. And what do we know about those things is that eating a high amount of animal products that have high amounts of fat can lead to negative health consequences. So it's crazy because like we were colonized centuries ago, but that food oppression through the foods that were brought here or here, the Americas, um, still continues to this day and even thinking about modern foods like the mcdonald's the burger kings that are being exported to mexico from the u.s those are causing a lot of health issues for mexicans as well so it's just like you know it's a whole thing but yeah um when people say oh like how can you be mexican and vegetarian or vegan all these things it's like well actually most like truly indigenous mexican foods are already plant-based so i think that's that's a really important thing to remember and when speaking on the rest of the world like all other cultures you know people of the global majority also known as people of color um you look at asian foods like the grand majority of asian foods don't even have dairy um i think you know there's ghee and stuff in indian foods but they they don't really use a lot of dairy in, in east asia And um, a lot of like very indigenous African foods are very uh, plant forward as well. So like Ethiopian food, for example, is so, so vegan friendly, like lots of lentils, lots of grains. So really like there is a multitude of cultural plant based foods out there. Um, Really, when people ask me like, oh, you're vegan. Well, what do you eat? I think that's such an interesting question because honestly when you think of food in the world the animal products are in the minority like in the very 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 small minority because there is just such a variation of plant foods like all over the world and it's really beautiful to see people of the global majority like accepting eating more plant-based foods and going vegan because it's not a white people thing like it truly is a, a global thing Uh, I love that you busted that myth because I've heard it so many times. Um, Are there any other myths that you can help us like rewind and understand better? Yeah. Yeah. I think protein is the biggest one. Um, Protein, you know, a lot of people 
ask, where do I get my protein? If I had a dime for every time I got that question, I would probably not need to work. <laughs> like I've gotten it so much. Um, so here's the funny thing, like in the Western world and in developed countries where malnutrition is not a huge issue and people have access to food, they're at, the majority of the citizens, like I'll just speak on US citizens, are getting way too much protein. So the average American actually gets twice the amount of protein that they truly need. And you might think like, okay, well, a little extra protein never hurt anybody. But when it's coming from these animal products that not just have protein, but also high levels of cholesterol and fat, you know, I'm not demonizing fat here, but there is something to be said about the overconsumption of it. And it can lead to other negative health consequences. So you know, in on the other side of the spectrum, have you ever heard anyone dying from a protein deficiency? Mm, like straight up? No. No? Okay. That's because it is extremely rare. Um, there's actually a word for the condition. I forget what it is, but it's a word like most people have never heard of in their life. <laughs> so, you know, all that being said, like protein you're going to get enough of it because it's not just in animal products. It's also in fruits and vegetables and grains and beans and nuts and donuts have protein, you know, because they're made of wheat. Like pizza has protein because like bread also, you know, ice cream has protein because of the, like if it's dairy, well, dairy has protein, but if it's non-dairy, like there's other ingredients in it. Like there's just protein in everything, not just meat or dairy or eggs. And I think the sooner we can embrace that and stop being so obsessed about me, like it will just benefit everyone, not just vegans, like, because eating too much protein does have negative uh, health effects. So I always say, um, and someone asked me, like, how do you get your protein? I just answer that, like, there's protein in everything. And, you know, as long as someone eats their daily recommended amount of food and calories and they're not under eating they're gonna get their necessary amount of protein um unless you're a bodybuilder and then you might need more but even then like you can get it from plant-based sources and some of the strongest bodybuilders out there are all actually vegan like there's a ton of really successful athletes so that's another myth is like vegans are weak or malnourished and that's just not true with any diet, honestly, and when I say diet, I mean like the foods we eat on a daily basis. Um, with any diet and any form of eating, you need to do your research to make sure you're getting all your nutrients. Even if I wasn't vegan, even if I was an omnivore, I couldn't just willy nilly like eat whatever I want all the time and not think about, oh, like, am I getting enough vitamin D? Do I need more iron? Like, even people that aren't vegans get their blood work done because sometimes there's deficiencies in our diet. So the same goes for vegans or vegetarians. Like we still need to do our research. We still need to make sure we're eating a balanced diet, getting those fruits and veggies and the grains and the beans and, and all the different thing, good things that we need in our, in our life. Um, but one of the common myths is like vegans are deficient in B12 and in vitamin D. And yeah, that, might happen more often in vegans than like uh, meat eaters, but that's just something to be mindful of. And I get my blood work done at least every year. So I know that I'm good. Um, but I do take a multivitamin as well, because again, like most people need a multivitamin anyway, <laughs> like, um, you know, a lot of our foods are lacking nutrients. And even if we are eating a balanced diet um, and eating a lot of fruits and veggies, like our soils and in the agriculture, like industrialized agriculture industry has just gotten so depleted from the style of farming in the United States where it's monocropping. So it does deplete a lot of nutrients from the soils and the tomatoes we're eating now are not as full of nutrients as like the tomatoes our grandparents were eating. So I think in general, it's important to be mindful of those nutrients, not just if you're vegan. Um, but yeah, those are the two main myths I hear a lot is the protein and like being weak and being, um, deficient in nutrients. And to that, I have to say, like, anyone can be deficient in nutrients, not just vegans, but definitely, um, you know, those are all myths and, and some of the healthiest people I know are, are vegan. So, 
I'm glad you touched on the protein question because I secretly wanted to ask because that yeah. is like, I don't know, that's what I've heard. And if you mm -hmm. just hear one thing, then you don't know what you don't know, really. Exactly. Yeah. Um, did you have a favorite food growing up? And if it wasn't vegan, mm -hmm. have you been able to make it vegan? Yes. So my favorite food growing up was chilaquiles and traditionally that has sometimes has chicken um most of the time has eggs for sure and dairy like cheese and crema topped so multiple things not vegan in that situation and yeah i've been able to veganize it i actually have a recipe for it um, that I've shared multiple times on Instagram and have it in one of my ebooks. But it's tofu chilaquiles. So instead of the eggs, I use scrambled tofu. And then the sauce is I was always um, a red chilaquiles fan. I know that some people go for verde, rojo, like I'm all for the rojo red sauce. So the ones I make have this um, chipotle adobo red sauce and it's really good. I really love smoky flavors. So that has that smokiness in it. Um, and then sometimes if I want to, if I'm feeling like I want that extra creaminess, I will top it with vegan cheese. But most of the time it's just so good by itself, like it doesn't really need the cheese that I'll just eat it with the tofu and the tortilla chips and the sauce. And it's really, really easy to make. So I always feel very comforted by that because that was one of my favorite meals growing up. That's awesome. I love chilaquiles as well. Mm -hmm. So that's cool that it's kind of simple to make yeah. it vegan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about drinks. Is it easy yeah. to find drinks that are vegan? Mm -hmm. So what kind of drinks? Like just in general, like hot drinks or alcoholic or non or? I guess maybe the traditional Mexican drinks. And I'm thinking like mm -hmm. uh, chocolate caliente and mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. like the... Uh, just like as we are entering the holidays, like I know mm -hmm. that there's a lot of drinking going on with the celebrations. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'd be curious about alcoholic beverages as well. Yeah, I'll start with the like warm drinks. So um, chocolate, like chocolate caliente. So I am a fan of the abuelita chocolate and I'm pretty sure it is accidentally vegan. Like it's just the chocolate and then you melt it in the pot and like or at least that's how I make it like I'll um do milk and like put the bar inside and just like be whisking it so as long as the milk that you use is vegan then you're good and again like there's so many options so for those that hot chocolate I like to use almond milk as I find that like sometimes with soy milk when you boil it or like heat it a lot it just has this weird aftertaste maybe it's the brand I'm using um but I I like to use almond milk or oat milk oat milk is extra creamy so if you like a little bit like heavier like creamier hot chocolate that one is good to make and then with like agua de jamaica or like any agua fresca that's going to be automatically vegan because it's literally just fruit and water um horchata is not traditionally vegan so because it has evaporated milk or condensed milk um, so, but it's very simple to make at home. So like if I'm ever craving horchata, I'll just make it at home. Um, with the little powdered horchata, like I think now you can fry a powder and add water and just like make horchata that way. So it's kind of like the, the easy route. I think some of those powders might be accidentally vegan too. So when I say accidentally vegan, that means that there's no animal products in the food, but it wasn't purposefully made to be vegan. So for example, if you go to Whole Foods and you buy like a pizza with vegan cheese on it, like that was purposefully made to be vegan. But if I go to Walmart and buy some Oreos and I check the product list and it doesn't have milk, it doesn't have eggs, that is accidentally vegan because like those Oreos weren't specifically made to be vegan. Um, so that's where that term comes from. And then speaking on alcoholic drinks, most of the time they are vegan because I don't think a lot of people put dairy in, in their alcoholic drinks, at least like the ones I usually drink. I know like there's some white Russian or rompope, like eggnog that definitely does have dairy or egg in it. Um, so 
it's just, you know, you can easily replace the, the cow's milk for um, plant-based milk. So I think that's an easy swap. But yeah, most of the time drinks are pretty easy to veganize because it's literally just swapping the milk or, you know, not not using egg whites. I know like egg whites are sometimes included in drinks. There's like multiple vegan uh, recipes I've seen like circulating throughout Instagram, the internet in general. So it's really just a matter of Googling vegan, whatever drink you want to make. And I promise you will find a recipe for it. Like it's crazy how many um, bloggers and like influencers, creators out there that are putting out all these vegan recipes. And even I've seen a lot of um, recipes being made by like bloggers that aren't even vegan, but they'll make vegan recipes because it's just such a like high demand thing now. So there's a lot of options out there to find your vegan drink of choice. <laughs> I think there are a lot more, uh, like it's easier to find vegan products in stores mm-hmm. and then also mm-hmm. like Google, um, much easier to find recipes than like 10 years ago when mm-hmm. I was like in college or like starting to cook on my own. So yeah. So yeah, I think Google is your best friend when trying mm-hmm. to figure anything out. Um, yeah. As far as cooking, definitely. I even like look up typical recipes on Google and mm-hmm. I will, I, okay, I'm going to admit that sometimes yeah. I will look the simplest things like how long do you cook rice or like how long, I I did not grow up being taught like basic cooking skills. Mm -hmm. And so I have at one point looked up, like, what's the time for boiling an egg? Mm. Yeah. Hey, there's no shame in that. Like you are definitely not the only one. I think a lot of us um, weren't taught like the basic stuff. Like for example, my fiance is from Nepal and like rice is really huge in both of our cultures. I wasn't taught to wash or like rinse rice before cooking it. So like the first time I made rice for him, like when we were living together, he was just like, did you rinse that? You didn't rinse that? I'm not eating that. (laughs) So I was just like super embarrassed because I didn't even know you were supposed to rinse rice. I mean, now I do it, but it's just like little things like that where, you know, not everyone is taught the same way or not everyone's taught at all. So you just kind of have to learn as you go sometimes. Same, same. I think I started rinsing rice like just a handful of years ago. Well, I have loved this whole conversation. Um, I would love for you to give some encouragement or advice for the next generation. Yeah, gosh, I love that question. Um, Some of the best things that I've been told I'll share a couple of them. And these are like just general life. Um, one of them like is from someone I follow called Rachel Luna. Her Instagram's at Girl Confident. But she said this one thing um, at a conference once and it really stuck with me. And it's make a decision and make it work, which I am very indecisive person. Um, and one day I'll stop identifying that way. It's something I need to work on for sure. But I just find sometimes it's really hard to make a decision and we get overwhelmed by all these choices, especially in today's world where we have all this freedom to choose what we want to do. Um, so I always, when I'm feeling like I can't make a decision, I always remember those words because no matter which way you go, like you just got to make it work for you and, and stick to that decision and have your own back on making whatever decision you do make. And then another thing I always remember I tend to be an anxious person. My grandfather once said, preocuparse, so like worrying, is ocuparte antes de. So essentially it's like worrying is to occupy yourself before the fact. But in the the word in Spanish, preocupar, ocupar means to like occupy yourself. So, you know, whenever I'm feeling really worrying or anxious about something, I always remember like, why am I, like worrying about it is not going to change it and it's not going to help. A lot of times it makes things worse because then you're all anxious about it and stressing and then your head about it. So I always remember those words from my grandfather. Um, It's like, don't occupy your mind before the thing even happens. And then the last thing I'll share is um, 
specifically relating to like if you're interested in going vegan or vegetarian or you know just changing your habits to be more healthier is like your body is the number one home that you have in your life one body in this lifetime so taking care of it is one of the most worth- worthwhile things i've ever done and choosing to go vegan not only take care of takes care of my home and my body but also the earth which is our second home so it takes care of your two homes that you'll have um no matter what in this lifetime and i think that even if you can't go 100% vegan just making small choices throughout the day or throughout your life that are more plant-based or more friendlier for the earth is always worth the extra effort that's amazing thank you so much for sharing all of those yeah. little pieces i think even if um i think that can be helpful for anybody who is listening um where can people find you? And more specifically, like if someone wants to work with you, what would the Mm -hmm. process for that be? Yeah. So people can find me on Instagram at Veggie Vale. So V-E-G-I. Veggie is not spelled like it usually is. So watch out. V-E-G-I-V-A-L-E. And you can find my newsletter and my Instagram. If you're not super into social media, I do send out emails every two weeks. And then if you want to work together, I am accepting one-on-one private clients for my four-month coaching container. So the process for that is you send me a DM saying you're interested in working together, or we you can just book a sales call through the link in my bio and we hop on a sales call. I do not push anyone to uh, say yes. Like I always make sure it's a good client and coach relationship and that there's a connection there and that I can actually help you. But we get on the sales call, I give you your treatment plan, what we would be working on in the four months, and then you can say yes or no. And yeah, I have three slots available for my one-on-one coaching. And then the other offer I have is a lifestyle audit intensive. So this is one week of private coaching and we hop on a longer call and we go through different areas of your life where you're struggling. It's more lifestyle focused, more healthy habits, not as much nutrition specifically, but yeah, that is the two ways that people can work with me aside just hanging out on Instagram and email newsletter. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This conversation has been so enlightening for me and I hope our listeners as well. I really appreciate your willingness to share uh, your story, to share honestly. And yeah, thank you. I hope to meet you in person one day. Yeah. I know that our relationship started on Instagram and has continued virtually. So hopefully one day we can meet in person. Yeah, that would be amazing. We need to have a, a meetup at some point. But yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciated having this conversation. I hope, you know, whoever is listening benefited from it or got a little nugget. Yeah, well, thank you so much and we'll talk soon. Bye. All right. Bye. Oh my goodness. I learned so much and I appreciate having these conversations shame-free. Give her a follow to learn even more as she shares so much on social media and even has a recipe ebook that you can download. Okay, amigos, thank you so much for listening. There'll be a new episode every Tuesday. So after you listen, feel free to take a screenshot, post on Instagram and tag at Elevating La Cultura or send me a DM. You can also comment on this YouTube video if you're watching online. I always like to hear from people and how they resonate with the stories that I share. So leave a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get more ears listening to these stories and we can continue elevating la cultura. All right, enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening. Y nos vemos next week. Bye.